Hi, my name is Michelle Steffler. Thank you so much for joining me for part three of Historical American Masterpieces Explained. So here we are, it's around 1900s, and we have a man named Alfred Steiglitz, who is a photographer. His, one of his photos of Lake George, New York is on the left. And he, in the 1900s, he began using large format cameras and he's considered one of the most truly kind of modernist photo photographers. Um, he's very intensely direct. There's not a trace of handwork on either negative or the prints, no diffused focus. He just, in his words, just the straight goods. Um, they're just a very sharp focus converged on intersecting planes, shapes, and angles. And he primarily was interested in in informal qualities of a uh, sort of of uh, in artwork um his wife who was many years his junior they didn't marry till later in life but his wife is a woman named georgia o'keefe and her work is on the right in fact that's her as she was um getting older um she has a lot in common with me um her name is georgia o'keefe and she shares many of my own experiences she was born in new york like i was worked as an art teacher for many years and eventually fell in love with the outdoors and moved to the southwest um, she would travel back and forth. Um, Alfred would stay in New York and there they had uh, not only um, an art studio there, but also an art gallery. But uh, eventually he passed away. So she was a widow. And there she continued to paint in the South uh, the Southwest. She painted um, botanicals, bones from animals in her long, long walks where she would find bones, antlers from animals. She would paint that landscapes and in large scale in a place called Ghost Ranch out, um, in San outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, this man, Charles de Muth, uh, he is known for painting these very kind of high forced angled, forced perspective. Uh, this famous one on the right is called Number Five. And this particular painting is derived its title from a poem which reads, Among the Rain and Lights, I Saw the Figure Five in Gold and Red. The intersecting lines repeated five round forms of the numbers, lights, street light, lamp, blaring sirens, red fire engine, together infused the painting uh, with this very vibrant urban energy. Demuth was fascinated with the American landscape, which was being altered at the hands of industrialism. And he saw this firsthand uh, with the smokestacks and the water towers in towns such as New York and Philadelphia. He painted those skylands and contrasted them with grain elevators and water towers that were common in his hometown. His emphasis on geometrical forms and industrial subject matter came to exemplify the ideals of a type of artwork called precisionism. And you can see the, how precise he is. It's almost like sign making. Demuth and his fellow precisionists painted distinctly American landscapes in the intentional move to distance themselves from what was being painted in Europe and the European artists. So this was a very intentional move to paint America the way it really is, the way it's changing, and their, and their kind of perspective on it. Next we have Grant Wood. Um, this summer I was actually in uh, Iowa and I was able to see Grant Wood's art studio. That was very interesting for me to see that. Grant Wood was uh, close to his high school art teacher in Iowa and she helped him enroll in the prestigious School of Art Institute at, of Chicago. Side by side studying art, he was also taught um, to work on silver. So he worked as a silversmith. He designed jewelry. He did carpentry and designed houses for people to make a living and support his family. Um, when I say his family, I mean his mother and his sister, sister Nan, that he was very close to. He eventually left Iowa briefly to take trips to Paris and Munich. Um, as I said, he worked as an art teacher, uh, but he took summer trips and vacationed to study European styles of art. From his time there, Wood realized what he wanted to paint were simple things which hold value for him and life in general. 
would eventually return to his home state and started painting vigorously with nostalgic farm scenes that were a source of endless inspiration for him. Wood is credited for not only reintroducing the concept of American, what they call regionalism, back into the art world, but also giving it a national audience. So what's happening now is American regionalism, artists from a certain time or some from a certain place in America is painting that realistic um, portrayal of what it's like to live in that in that particular area. Um, this is an historical scene of Paul Revere. Uh, I circled it with yellow. You can see very small, but there's a man on a horse and that's Paul Revere um, making his way by horse uh, back through towns shouting the British are coming. The middle painting, probably really well known by everybody on this uh, that's watching this, this is called American Gothic. And it portrays what you might believe is a husband and wife working on a farm. But what it actually is, it's supposed to be um, a father and daughter. And you can see that there's uh, you know, this sense that they're very church going people. They're very serious people, very stoic, very unemotional. And just very, you know, they work where they're, they're, they value family, they value God, and they value work. So the core of the American values. Um, then on the right, this is titled Parson Weems' Fable of George Washington, Chopping Down the Cherry Tree. And Parson Weems, it was, it was an author who created this fable that um, George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. And when he was confronted, he said, I cannot tell a lie. And that's a myth. Nearly all of the lines in this painting are pointing towards Washington and his axe, the hand, the fingers of the trio in the foreground, the edges of the house, the ladder and the silver of the tree bark. This immediately draws our attention to that spot. The repetition of the circles and the curves guides our eyes around this painting. And of course, uh, the, the man uh, who is supposed to be uh, the author, Parson Weems, holding back this curtain is kind of giving it more of a theatrical look. There's a curve on the curtain, the trees, the cherries, and the circle of mulch around the bottom of the tree. So it gives it a very roundness. There's a lot of roundness to his um, almost like bubble landscape here. And if you, you might know that Iowa is very flat, uh, but there are areas where there's, there's sections or crops where there might be sort of a, a little bit of an incline. And so Grant is painting... Um, that very beautiful Iowa landscape. And the artist was uh, sad that the fables of early America were being lost to a new generation. Um, a side note, Grant Wood passed away uh, soon after he was laid off from his job at the University of Iowa teaching art. And he was let go because there were uh, rumors of his homosexuality. And soon after he found out that he was ill and died, um, I believe he died before he was 50 of, I think it was pancreatic cancer. So he died pretty, it was pretty painful and pretty sudden. Peggy Guggenheim, although not really an artist herself, um, she had a daughter and a son. Her daughter was an artist and her name was Peggy Guggenheim. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this woman because she is certainly very colorful. Peggy Guggenheim was born in 1898 in New York City into great wealth due to the family's fortune in the mining and smelting industries. Her father, Benjamin Guggenheim, and his brother, Solomon R. Guggenheim, were power brokers. You might know that name, Solomon Guggenheim, because he is named for the uh, museum that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in New York City that is in the round. It's circular, it's round and round, and you go up in, in a spiral. Uh, Peggy described her childhood as guilt-edged, and though her family lived like royalty, she and her sisters were often left to themselves, as her mother was neglectful and her philandering father was often absent. Nonetheless, Peggy admired her father, and when he died in the sinking of the RM, 
USS Titanic. So his fa her father went down with the Titanic when she was 13. She suffered what she would describe as a nervous breakdown. Her father had also lost money in his businesses. So while the family was still relatively wealthy, they felt poor in comparison to the other Guggenheims. As Peggy said, I never considered myself a real Guggenheim anymore after that. Rejecting her privileged roots, she became a rebel, shocking her family by shaving off her eyebrows and said that she perceived to be as the black sheep of the Guggenheim family. She moved to Europe different parts of Italy. She studied classical and Renaissance paintings. She, li she lived on her inheritance and began a collection of modern art, which eventually became housed in her home in Venice, Italy. She is known for discovering and supporting the careers of modern art's biggest names, Picasso, Miro, and Pollock. So here is Peggy Guggenheim with her, her beautiful dogs um, on the Venice Canal. Her dogs are buried here at her home. So is she. And the home is now converted into uh, the Peggy Guggenheim collection, which is houses her work of modern art. So she was really a, um, an early uh, uh, sort of philanthropist for, to the uh, modern art movement, early collector. Post-World War II, New York replaced Paris, France as the center of the art world. We have U.S. movements such as modern art. We talked about that. We're moving towards postmodern art and pop art, which have all been associated with having American roots. Um, here we have Jackson Pollock, who I mentioned on the previous slide. He's also known as Jack the Dripper, and he was an American artist who took house paint and dripped it and kind of did like these action paintings, uh, very furiously layers upon layers of um, really non-objective artwork, really nothing. It's not, it's just colors. It's just the, the elements of art. Really, there's no subject matter, so to speak, in Jackson Pollock's art. Peggy Guggenheim was the first to commission Jackson Pollock for a large mural that was to be um, in her one of her relatives' New York apartments, and uh, he completed that mural. This is W. H. Johnson. Um, this is an example of social realism or everyday hardships depicted by American artist William Henry Johnson, who was born in South Carolina, the son of an African-American mother and an absent white father. He left home at the age of 17. He moved to Harlem, New York, and due to his resilience and work ethic, he landed himself a sponsored trip abroad to study art. Arriving in Paris in 1926, Johnson thrilled to the city's vibrant cultural scene and its participants. He married a Dutch woman and eventually found employment with the WPA initiatives. Johnson said, my aim is to express in a natural way what I feel both rhythmically and spiritually. All that has been saved up in my family roots of primitiveness and tradition, which is now concentrated on me, unquote. Drawing on African-American culture and history, he featured religious subjects, political themes, the rural South, and modern military. So again, here's an example of the everyday life. You might even say regionalism because it, you might say that a lot of these uh, images are some of um, the, the um, early um, South and uh, it kind of tag teams with this artist named Stuart Davis. Uh, first, what do you notice about the colors that the artist uses? So there's red, black, white, yellow, and green. It might remind you of a certain, you know, certain um, culture, cultural um, flag. It might remind you of a certain continent like Africa. Stuart did that on purpose. He was an early American modernist painter. He was well known for his jazz influenced pop art paintings of the 1940s and 50s, bold, brash, colorful, um, and as well as his Ashcan school pictures. And Ashcan really just means, as I said earlier, the artist moving away from the European ideals, the artist moving towards the American style, a new style. Okay. 
here is uh, Ashcan also enveloped the idea that art is for art's sake. And I took these two quotes from artists that disagreed with that. So it wasn't a blanket statement that everybody agreed with. The idea that art for art's sake, doing art not for a commission, not for the consumer, not for the viewer, not for museums, but really just for the artist, art for art's sake, was um, Pablo Picasso famously disagreed. This was one of his quotes. The, this idea of art for art's sake is a hoax. And then Frank Lloyd Wright, who was an architect on the bottom right, art for art's sake is a, the philosophy of the well-fed. So something to think about as we move into both modernism and postmodernism. I'm going to let you read that for a minute. Okay, so postmodernism is now we're moving into a time where there's new media and techniques and materials that stresses communication from the artist to the audience. So now the burden is on you to kind of figure it out. They're not going to spoon feed you anymore. It's not going to be as evident. Here's an African-American painter named Romira Bearden, and he's best known for his collages, which he created largely on painted paper, magazine clippings, and bits of fabric. Based largely on his boyhood memories of life in rural South and in New York during the Harlem Renaissance, Bearden's work vividly captures the cultural aspects of the American Black. He developed an interest in collages while experimenting with new forms using clippings from magazines during the civil rights movement. These works were done in a style influenced by Cubism. Bearden was also a songwriter, a book illustrator, and designed occasional theater sets for the Alvin Ailey American Dance Company, which is a, um, a black uh, dance company based in Harlem, New York. And our last two are photographers. I wanted to introduce you to uh, Richard Avedon, who was a Jewish American photographer and one of the most prominent photographers of the 21st century. From 1979 through 1984, Avedon was asked to make several trips through the Western United States to photograph workers by visiting locations such as state fairs, factories, slaughterhouses, ranches, and roadside diners in 13 states and 189 towns from Texas to Idaho. The people he chose to photograph were drifters and coal miners, waitresses and factory workers among them, were not the brawny cowboys of the past that we saw from the West. They were, weren't the rosy-cheeked frontier families of Western lore, but everyday people coping with the often harsh realities of the working class rural life. Avedon photographed his subjects against a white backdrop, eliminating any reference to a landscape, which was a long staple of Western image, images or imagery. So here's what he did. He took, like this is a coal miner. He took the coal miner out of the landscape and put the coal miner in front of a white backdrop, photographed the, the coal miner with just an everyday expression, and he's asking you to kind of figure out through body language what is going on or what this man might be feeling. And this is the early days of digital art, digital photography, I should say, the early days of digital photography. So that's Richard Abaddon. On the right, we have Dorothea Lang, who was an American photographer. She was a female, and she uh, photographed images for the farm Security Administration, FSA, a division of the U.S. government that represented the interests of the American farm workers, including tenement farmers and people of color. During this time, Lang recorded the conditions of workers living in the poverty-stricken areas of the West Coast, 
the South and the Midwest, including the camps that resulted from the Dust Bowl migration. The photographs from her tenure with the FSA has become iconic and considered a successful campaign to bring awareness to the plight of the migrant farm worker. Uh, this particular woman is a mother. She has, I believe, five children, and she's not that. She's really not that old. She's probably in her thirties. But you can see that um, there's just this look of anguish and anxiety on her face. This look of worry, and her children are embarrassed. They don't want to really be on film. Uh, children usually want to be on film, but not in this particular situation, right? They're kind of embarrassed at their situation. So again, this is a very uh, dramatic image, a uh, very popular image in our, in our culture. You probably have seen it before. And what Dorothea Lange's most famous, um, it's called Migrant Mother. And it really just puts the burden on the viewer for the viewer to, to uh, create a story about what might be happening. I thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed these three lectures and I, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.